Hello, my name is Shelley Kelly, and in this demonstration, we'll be working with some iron sulfide data. The first step is to pro do the pre-processing in Athena. I have the Athena window open here. And uh, the Athena has, uh, program has several um, panels br uh, broken up into different sections. So uh, we're going to go up here to the file to import some data. That's the first step. And we are going to find our iron sulfide data, which is right here. And the second one is here. All right, and this is the uh, column selection. And here's an example of what the data set looks like on the right hand side. That's what's inside the text file. And you can see that. Um, there are several columns with the column labels, achieved energy, requested energy, real-time clock, I0, I1, and I2. Since this is transmission data, it's probably I0 over I1. And we want to take the natural log. We should be able to plot that by clicking the uh, plot button. Let me get the plot up here. It's behind the window. Sorry. There it is. All right. And we can see that this looks like the usual transmission data. So we're going to just say OK. And it will automatically import the second data set in the same way. I forgot to check if this data has a reference file in it. So let's import the data one more time. Open. You can import a reference channel down here on the bottom, turn that on, and then I1 over I2 is probably what you want for the reference channel, and that looks like an iron foil spectrum is there. So, um, so let's plot the reference spectrum, and then you can go back up here and plot the actual data spectrum as shown there. All right, so let's do that one more time. Say OK. Now you can see that each data set is brought in with a second set underneath it as the reference file. These two data sets um, are linked. If you apply an energy shift to one data set, it will automatically apply the energy shift to the other data set. Let's read in the other. I only got one of the two data sets. Let's import the other one, number one, as well. So it saves all of the parameters that we had last time, which is very nice. We just say OK. And now we have the second data set as well. I'm going to go ahead and remove these first two copies. So we don't need those without the reference attached. Go up here to Group, Remove Marked, group, remove marked Groups. So those are both gone. And now we can click. Uh, the radial button here and use the purple buttons to plot this in energy and you can see the two scans are shown on top of each other here. We can zoom in on the energy range. Uh, this is around the E0 which is shown up here in this top corner so it's minus 20 EV to 80 EV above the edge. Click that in purple and you can see the two data sets are here. All right, so let's take a look at all four of them now. Plot those in energy. And it looks like they are really well aligned, the two of them. Let's pretend just for a minute that this data set was not aligned with the other one. You can see that I added an energy shift to the this data set here that's highlighted in blue. And now you can see that they are offset relative to each other. We can go to the Align window, which is underneath uh, the main window button here. There are several different types of windows. We can go to the Align data. And we can set the standard to be the reference for uh, the first data set shown there. And then we can highlight the second reference data set. And now we are plotting the smooth derivative of the reference foils. We can 
plot it in many different ways by changing this uh, selection button here, plot normalized mu of e, and you can see what we saw before. Usually the alignment's done with the derivative of the absorption edge. Um, it varies a lot, making a very nice peak here that we can align on. You can use the auto align button and Athena will um, align the data for you or you can uh, move the data in increments with these uh, handy buttons shown here. So I can move the red spectrum by 5 EV up or 5 EV back or we can do the auto align button shown here and it auto aligns them very nicely. The second data set is now not shifted um, really at all. The shift was moved from 1 EV to 0 0.047 which is really below our limit to be able to align. So if we return to the main menu we can see that this energy shift is up here in blue. Uh, that's the reference data set for this uh, main data set so they've both been shifted by the same amount and the first data set is not shifted at all. So we can mark our two data sets, click them in energy and you can see that they are very well aligned. So now we are going to merge those two data sets um, up here, merge them in mu of e. That makes a merged data file. It also merges the reference file for your uh, so that you can align this data set again with some other data if you needed to. It shows you the merged data and then the standard deviation which is very small because these data are uh, very much the same. All right, if we plot both all three of these in k space, you can see that the chi of k data is uh, really quite nice and extends to really high k range. So it, we, uh, we increase our window even further. So um, yeah, all the way out to 18. I don't, I don't really don't see very much uh, noise in these data at all. Uh, very clean spectra. All right, so let's show what our background, our, our sorry, the window looks like here. So right now, the Fourier transform parameters are from 3 to 15.3. Uh, the window shows you uh, what part of the data we're going to include in the Fourier transform. And when you do that, and click it in R, you can see what it looks like. So it looks like this data is dominated by two signals, uh, a first and a second shell, I would think. Let's show the, data, the Fourier transform all the way out to 10. Uh, there's a little bit of data out here. You can see the noise level uh, will show as a ringing artifact out here at high R. Um, there really is uh, very little noise in this data, so we'll be able to use all the way out to 15. Okay, so um, all right, so let's uh, let's t take a look at this data again and think about our K. Uh, min value. Usually a value of 3 is a good value. Um, we can see where that is on the absorption edge by using the plotting uh, indicators shown here. So if we want to show where 3 inverse angstroms is on the absorption edge, we can put that in here and then replot in E. And you can see that it's above the absorption edge about right, uh, right here. There are several different things you can do to change how the, uh, the, the background function shown in red here goes through the absorption edge. That's the tricky part to get that right for our data set. So we like to have uh, K min somewhere above the absorption edge where things aren't changing very rapidly. Uh, this, is a, this is a pretty good, a pretty good spot shown here. Um, In some of my other lectures, I show how you can change the value of E0, which will change how the spline goes, uh, uh, curves around the absorption edge uh, shown here. Another way to change uh, the curvature of the spline is to change uh, the, K, the spline range. So the curvature of the spline depends both um, on RBKG which uh, it 
tells you uh, how much curvature the background is allowed to have and also uh, the data range which is in K so from 0 to 17. So we can um, look at both of those so if I uh, plot the data in R again right now RBKG is 1 so that means that the background function is really trying to minimize the signal in the Fourier transform at uh, R values less than 1 so in this region. We can artificially bring that up to uh, 2 and we can remove some of the signal that's actually our data. So let's to do this let's make another copy of this data set. So if you right click you can copy the current data set and now we have two data sets. We can use this one as RBKG of 1 and this one here as RBKG of 2. Uh, we can show what that looks like. Uh, now the background um, has a huge amount of oscillations. You actually can't even hardly see the, uh, the data anymore because the oscillations are so huge. Let me see if I bring that down maybe a little bit. Uh, might make it easier to see. Let's try 1.5. Okay, 1.5. Now you can see that the background is uh, allowed to oscillate much more than it was previously. If you look at the data in K space, for both of these data sets, you can see that there's um, a big difference at low K. Um, out here at higher K above maybe 5 or so, it's pretty much the same. But even out here at higher R all the way through, there's a little bit of a change, um, a low frequency oscillation out here that's a little bit different between the two data sets. So let's look at them both in R. And you can see that this second data set is really truncating all of this signal here, um, probably a little bit too much compared to what the data wants. If we bring RBKG up even further to 2, as I said before, it's hard to look at in uh, energy, but we can look at it in R. You can see that we can actually remove uh, most of this first shell signal by increasing RBKG all the way up to 2. And we can look at the two data sets in K-space. And now what we have here is just the higher frequency signal. Um, and we've removed the, uh, the sulfur signal at low um, R from the data set. OK, so RBKG value of 1.0 is usually a good place to begin. So let's do that set that back and now that both data sets are the same again and we're going to just change the spline range a little bit and see how that affects the background so instead of 17 let's go to 15 and click the both of them and you can see that the second data set stops at 15 inverse angstroms and you can see here down at uh, low K, it's made a little bit of a difference uh, through the absorption edge. We can emphasize this region by plotting it with a K weight of 1, and you're able to see that more clearly here. So above this value of 3, looks like the data sets are really quite similar, so that's a good place to begin to use uh, for our Fourier transform. Let's take a look at that in energy just to see how it looks going through the absorption edge. So this is the one with a slightly shorter spline range. And this one is the one with the slightly longer spline range. OK. So now we talked about uh, the Fourier transform parameters. We'll be using about 3 to 15. And um, we talked about RBKG value. And we uh, e zero. Uh, the other two the other two uh, parameters that we didn't talk about were the pre edge and the normalization red edge. Let's just um, take a look at those real quick. So this one uh, we're going to plot the merged data set again. Uh, this time we're going to plot it without the background, but include the pre edge and the post edge. And we're going to back out a little bit so we can look at them more clearly. Also take the indicator off and plot that in energy. All right, so the pre-edge range is shown here. 
between these two uh, indicators and the pre-edge line is uh, the green line. The post-edge line is shown here in the uh, purple and the uh, the regions for that, that's the normalization range from 150 EV to 1000 EV above the absorption edge. We don't quite get all the way out there to see that. The normalization order, that means that this uh, purple line is allowed to curve a little bit, is 3. If you use 2, then it forces it to be a straight line. Um, I think that the curved line looks a little tiny bit better to my eye, so let's go ahead and use that curved line. And um, the difference between the post edge line and the pre edge line at the value of E0 shown right here is the edge step. And the data is um, uh, normalized, so it's divided by this edge step. It's directly proportional to the amplitude of the XF signal, which will affect your S0 squared, the amplitude reduction factor, or your coordination numbers in your final fitting. So you want to make sure that you take a look at this, the pre-edge and the post-edge region range. Make sure that they look uh, reasonable. There's one other thing in Athena that I'd like to show you, and that is a little bit about the backward Fourier transform. Uh, the parameters are shown uh, here in this box. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. So um, if we plot the data, in R, and then we back Fourier transform the data from um, 1 to about 2, 1 to 2, and then we can plot the data set and the back Fourier transform between those range, regions. You can see the um, you can see the effect of the window on the back Fourier transform function. And you can also see the main signal that's in these da this data set caused by that sulfur shell, as shown here. Now we can also back for you transform just the uh, the other side, if you will, from two to three. Plot that in K and Q, and that's the higher frequency signal. And you can see that, especially in this region here, there's a beat pattern between those two signals. And so this is the signal from uh, the higher coordination shell, um, and uh, we'll show that that's, that's actually an iron signal. If we plot this with k-weight of 2, it emphasizes the high k-range, and you can see that the iron signal has a bigger, bigger proportion and dominates out here at high k, whereas at the low k, the signal is dominated by the, ox by the sulfur shell. So from 1 to 2... Let's plot that one more time. You can see this is dominated by the um, sulfur shell. It dies out, whereas the other portion was dominated. If we do the back Fourier transform of the whole range, 1 to 3, then we're going to match the data really quite well. So we have all of the frequencies included uh, here. So that's a little bit about the backward Fourier transform. You can also interrogate the data to see if that second shell is an oxygen or a sulfur uh, by uh, using this trick. It's, uh, it's uh, using the different K weighting of the different signals. So as I mentioned before, the iron is weighted at high K. So if you take the Fourier transform and you look at this spectrum with a K weight of 1, you'll see that the amplitude of this first peak is about 0.4. The second one is about 0.25, or about half of the second one. If we use a K weight of 2, you see that uh, the second signal is higher compared to this first signal. It's because we're emphasizing the high K range where this signal dominates compared to that one. If we click K weight of 3, you can see that they are nearly equal in amplitude, and so that this is, uh, this is uh, getting even taller. You can show that in a more robust way by making a couple copies of the data set. Let's make one more copy. Copy the current data set. Show all three of them. We're going to use arbitrary K weights now. And we'll use an arbitrary K weight of 1, 2, and 3. Show those in R. Sometimes you have to click it back and forth a little bit to get that to take effect. There we go. All right. 
So um, k weight of three, of course, shows a much larger amplitude. So we're going to we're going to renormalize them to the first shell. So I'm going to put my cursor on the first one and multiply that by 25. Second one by five. Show that in R. Mm -hmm. Oops. First one, I'm sorry, is supposed to be multiplied by 25. Second one is by five, and third one is by one. Put those in R. So I over, no, I undershot. The first one is not multiplied by enough. Let's do 30. Um, still not quite enough. Let's try 40. There we go, getting close, 38R. And the second one, uh, more like six, 6.3. There we go. So now you can fairly clearly see, eh, maybe not so clearly, you can see that the uh, the second shell signal grows as the first shell signal is uh, stays the same. If we can look at that also in R space, real part of the Fourier transform, and let's zoom in R. You can see very clearly here that the blue data set is smaller, and then the uh, red data set and the green data set are growing. So this part of the spectrum is becoming more and more important. It takes up more and more of the total signal as you weight uh, the higher K range more compared to the uh, lower K range where the oxygen signal dominates. All right, so that's all I wanted to show you. We've uh, determined that uh, this signal on, this, on the high side here is due to a a heavy scattering atom compared to the first shell, which is sulfur, most likely iron. In the next part, I'll show you how to model this data. Thank you.